Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Social Science Responses to Climate Change and first of all apologies for the uh, kind of uh, little bit of a wait there. We just had a few technical issues behind the scenes, but it's great to have you with us. My name is Lauren Rickards. I'm the director of the Cross Disciplinary Urban Futures Platform at RMIT University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I'm living and working here. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. And RMIT University also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this discussion of social science responses to climate change. So as most of you know, this event is part of a large program of events that the Australian Academy of Social Sciences is hosting as part of their Social Sciences Week. And I definitely encourage you to jump onto their website and see what else is coming up for the remaining day tomorrow as part of the week. I know there's a stellar panel on renewable energy at 11 o'clock tomorrow if you're interested. But what we're here tonight to discuss is the much larger context and more unruly question of climate change. So as a social scientist myself who works on climate change, including helping write the latest IPCC report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, I can confirm that climate change is indeed an all encompassing and unruly topic and is a thoroughly through and through social issue. It's also a real emergency that all of us in all walks of life and areas of work need to address. So for this reason, the social sciences, whether human geography, politics, economics, sustainability science, sociology or organisational studies or any of the other FOR codes in between, social sciences need to be at the forefront of responses to climate change. At the same time, like all academic disciplines, all knowledge systems and all human activities more broadly, the social sciences themselves are deeply challenged by climate change and its increasingly far reaching and complex impacts, including the imperative to rapidly decarbonise society. So to discuss this with me tonight, I have five leading social scientists uh, who've given up their evening or in some cases morning to be here. Uh, and discuss what this issue looks like from their particular disciplinary background and institutional context. So what I want to do is introduce them all and then we'll jump into the questions. Before I do so though, can I please encourage all of you to um, utilise the chat function, jump in with reflections and questions. Uh, and please note too that we're going to be recording the session as well. <laughs> trigger hit record. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, if I think um, we would start with those uh, who are starting the day around 10.30, I'm told, uh, over on the other side of the globe, we'll start with Saffron O'Neill, who's Associate Professor at the University of Exeter in the UK. So Saffron's research explores the social science dimensions of climate variability and change particularly focusing on the visual communication of climate change. She currently holds a Leverhulme Research Fellowship on the topic of the visual life of climate change. Interestingly, she's also co-director of the ESRC ACCESS program, which stands for Advancing Capacity for Climate and Environment Social Science, and we'll hear about that. We also have, from not too far away from there, Adam Standring, who's from the Centre for Environmental and Sustainability Social Sciences at Arebro University in Sweden. So Adam is a Marie Curie Fellow at the Centre for Urban Research in Austerity at De Montford University and, as I said, at Arebro. His principal research interests are the political sociology of expertise and knowledge production. His most recent projects looks at the nature and understanding of expertise in the IPCC. We can have a very interesting discussion about this, Adam, uh, focusing particularly on social scientific expertise, which I have to say is definitely in the minority within that particular institutional context. Next, we have Wendy Steele, 
Uh, Wendy's research focuses on the nature of cities in the climate change with an emphasis on social and environmental equity and the implications for public policy planning and urban governance practices. Wendy uh, is a um, professor at RMIT and she has a large number of uh, big research projects uh, behind her around climate change, including a National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility grant on climate change adaptation as a cross-border agenda, an ARC DECRA fellowship on the governance of critical infrastructure in climate change, and an ARC discovery on socially innovative climate adaptation at the local scale. We also from RMIT, uh, as of the 1st of September, have Dr. Blanche Burley, uh, who is a research fellow in the Climate Change Transformations um, Group at the Centre for Urban Research and part of the Urban Futures Platform at RMIT. Blanche is a multidisciplinary social scientist whose work focuses on climate change, uh, including how people understand, experience and respond to climate change and how we might do this differently and better. Blanche focuses specifically on the ways in which climate change is felt, lived and imagined, especially in the realms of education, activism and community disaster responses. And we're also lucky to have with us Professor Noel Castry from the Climate Society and Environment Research Centre at the University of Technology, Sydney. So Noel is Professor of Society and Environment and an internationally renowned uh, human geographer, including being editor in chief of the Progress in Human Geography. Noel's own research interests are in how different kinds of environmental expertise, including social sciences, shape, or in some cases, many cases, fail to shape public understanding on important issues. He's writing a new book at the moment called Future Earth, Speaking for Planet and People in the Age of Consequences. So welcome panel members. <laughs> Great to have you with us. So to kick us off, I'd love to um, jump in with the question or hear from each of you around how your area of social science uh, is helping us address climate change. So what's important or what's the contribution that your particular area, and you can depict that however you like, a narrow field or encompassing view of social science, what is it contributing in this effort to help us address climate change in all of its many manifestations. So we'll jump into a more um, unruly kind of discussion in a moment, but just to kick us off, maybe I'll throw to you Saffron, so I introduced you first um, to hear on your work. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren, and it's great to be here. Thanks for hosting this interesting panel event. Great to be here with all these eminent scholars from across Australia and the rest of the world. Good old hybrid um, organisation. Well done. Oh, so there's two, I guess there's two different ways I could talk about that. And the first is as the co-director of the Access Centre. Um, so this is a UK um, investment from the ESRC, which is our Economic and Social Research Council. Uh, it's six million pounds, which is about I did a quick Google this morning, about 10.5 million US dollar um, Australian dollars sorry so it's a really big investment in social science and the idea is that um you know as we all know as social scientists um so often social science expertise knowledge skills are um are not effectively utilized um linking into the policy space so that's really what the access network is trying to do so it's not a research project although there will be sort of small amounts of money within that to run small scale pilot work most of it is about you know networking collaboration um, um building um building those links basically between policy and um ac social science academics um it's really because as in the uk as in australia and elsewhere um too often environmental issues are often framed in this kind of techno fix way right we just need a, a better climate model we just need to downscale and um, we just need to do this and once we've done that then then the issue will be solved we know that really well the biggest challenges lie in how those decisions are valued who who owns them who has the power and so on and so forth all those really critical social science questions so yeah really we're trying to um bring that social science knowledge um into the policy arena for uh, those environmental um issues, net zero, biodiversity crisis, climate change. Um, in my own work, I work on climate change communication. So for me, it's all about making sure that um, when we're talking about public engagement with climate change, that we're really actually 
understanding how people engage with climate change in their everyday lives, what's important to people, what do they value and how does that affect um, how they live their lives and um, yeah, uh, how that can be uh, more effectively uh, sort of understood in terms of agendas like net zero. Um, I can talk about that more, but I'll give, a, give the microphone over to others. Perfect, thank you, Saffron. You uh, definitely opened up some of the most important um, aspects we want to dive into. And they relate nicely to some of the work you're doing, I know, Adam. Do you want to jump in and tell us a bit about what you're working on from your perspective? Yeah, thank you for the invite, Lauren. I think we might be hearing the phrase techno fixes, techno scientific fixes <laughs> quite a lot over the next hour. Um, but yeah, this is really what my work is is concerned with as well, or the work that we're doing in, in Erdobru in environmental sociology. One of the things that we're deeply concerned with is how knowledge and expertise is or could or should be positioned towards transformative change, towards addressing uh, these big issues like climate change and environmental breakdown. So one of the particularly strong uh, research threads that we have is this uh, analysis of the big, large global uh, environmental knowledge production institutions, particularly the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is kind of where my research is laid, but also uh, the, the, the younger cousin of this, ITBEST, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And, you know, we recognise that these aren't the only sources of environmental knowledge and action uh, uh, out there, but they've become particularly important, legitimate, authority, authoritative, especially at the political level, at the international political level, in framing the nature and the problem of climate change, biodiversity loss, as well as outlining and delineating the possible solutions, remedies, mitigations that we can, we can apply, although as their mandate states, they're not policy prescriptive. So they carry this big authority and we felt it important to better understand the diversity of expertise that they uh, employ or use to produce their knowledge, uh, including epistemic or disciplinary diversity that they incorporate in their, in their report. So the questions that have been kind of guiding our research is how do participants themselves the people who are actually involved in producing these reports and producing this knowledge understand environmental expertise, what's its nature, its form, what are the practices, what are the policy, what is the policy relevance that it has, what are the institutional practices that are in place to offer uh, diverse contributions, what are the opportunities and the constraints for, for, for diversity there, so how are experts selected uh, to participate in these, how are they encouraged to participate and how are they given voice? What is the is the is the result of this? And do conflicts between different forms or sources of expertise, different knowledge systems, different different uh, disciplinary approaches occur? And if so, uh, how are they resolved? So these are the kind of questions that we've been trying to think through, and that we think that social science, environmental sociology, is well positioned to to, to tackle. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've touched on there, I think, one of the absolutely unique aspects of social science that comes out in climate change work, which, of course, is that social science is very interested in science, in knowledge and knowledge production and the politics of knowledge is sort of the, possibly the most reflexive in that sense. Um, but it's not just about the abstract knowledge, it's about what we do with it and how we create organisations and systems such as IPCC and universities as well and academies. Um, because that does relate, I know, closely uh, to your work, Noel, I might throw to you next because I know you've uh, looked at this in depth as well. So if you, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lauren, again. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, I'm going to slightly dodge the invitation and just uh, make a couple of general comments, if that's OK. Um, so. Um, I think I mean the first one is I think we, we just need to acknowledge because it may be obvious to, to us on the panel but not necessarily obvious to everyone else that um, climate change can't speak for itself. You know it's not like the weather we can't experience it directly um, and in fact you know the, the incredible meteorological events that we've experienced across the globe this year they couldn't even be taken as signs of a climatic shift without that incredible hard work and patient work of geoscientists going back 30, 40, 50 years like Michael Mann in the in the United States. So, you know, um, as Bruno Latour once said, exaggerating only slightly, no reality without representation. 
So geoscientists have, I guess, spoken for an earth that cannot speak for itself. And yeah, social scientists and humanists are really important potential spokespeople for what climate change means, not the physical mechanics of it, but what it what it represents to us as a species, a different society. So it's an obvious point, but I think it's really worth making that point. Um, and the second thing, um, and it's, this is going to sound a bit negative, but I'm going to turn it into a positive in just a second. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think people on the panel are aware, but not necessarily everyone else, particularly in the public realm is aware that in the last 25 years in particular, there has been an absolutely massive social investment in universities in climate research in the social sciences and the humanities. In other words, across many disciplines, and Lauren, you alluded to this in your introduction, there's been a sort of climate turn in the disciplines in sociology and philosophy and human geography and anthropology. We could carry on and on and on. It's not been orchestrated. It's been people like us independently making decisions, uh, often in teams, but often alone to change the focus of our research. Um, and, you know, there are some wonderful publications. Um, I mentioned Latour, his book Down to Earth, which is quite a recent one, is, is a great example of kind of creative thinking about what climate change means. You've got economists like Dieter Helm at Oxford. Uh, you've got geographers like Holly Jean Buck, who's written a book called After Geoengineering, uh, which came out not long ago. The philosopher Stephen Gardner, very well known book in academia, uh, certainly our side of academia, uh, A Perfect Moral Storm about the moral implications of climate change. So all that's been going on, but it's not particularly well recognised outside the, the academy, I think, even today. And if you ask, uh, I guess, an ordinary member of the public, you know, so what do you think social science and the humanities are contributing to our understanding of climate change? They'll just, I haven't got a clue, would be the response, I think. Um, until you remind them of the economists and so they might think, OK, yeah, I might have heard of the Stern report. So then we get into the sort of economic framing, which is important. Um, but beyond that, I suspect geoscience tends to dominate people's imagination of what climate change is all about. So that sounds very negative. It's as if the, the climate, uh, the, the social sciences have an image problem when it comes to climate change. I don't think it's an image problem. I think, in fact, it's a bit of an image gap. Uh, is it really then a problem? Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, and I think a lot of us are making contributions to shaping understanding through our teaching with hundreds of thousands of students, through memberships of expert advisory bodies. Um, this week, I think, or this month in the UK, DEFRA, which is our environment uh, ministry in the UK, as uh, Saffron knows, uh, is recruiting or refreshing its social science expert panel. And I could go on. So I think in other words, there is a lot of work happening across the disciplines. It is having an impact, but it's not always publicly visible is the key point I guess I'm making. Thanks, Noel. Those are extremely uh, useful points and really starts to, I guess, um, point to why this question of social sciences and climate change is important. This isn't just a navel gazing little exercise. There's actually um, you know, a real issue here that we, that we need to address. Wendy, I wonder if I could throw to you next, because I know particularly, um, well, I know you've highly engaged uh, in some of these issues in your own work, and you also interestingly straddle planning and geography as well. So you see it from slightly different perspectives. Yeah, th thanks very much, Lauren. And uh, it's been really interesting to hear the speakers that have come before and their thoughts and perspectives. We don't have your camera on, Wendy. If that <laughs> says that my camera is on, but. <laughs> oh, OK, well, we'll keep working on that in the background. It's a very yeah. nice photo we have. Continue. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> anyway, it says that my camera's on, but um, uh, look, if, if we think about, you know, climate, the climate emergency as being not just about weather of mass destruction, but also about the cycles of extraction, consumption and production, um, if we think about our cities as being not just buildings and roads, but also about you know, the lived messy experiences and practices of people, communities, um, their fetishes, their ambitions, uh, their pains, their, their joys, you know, all of this complexity can only really be captured uh, through the social sciences, the humanities and the arts. And it's critical um, that those perspectives are brought to bear uh, on this really important agenda. And I mean, if we want to talk about 
transformation, which seems to be the agenda, you know, the need for a transformative revolution to address this emergency. Um, well, how will transformation be achieved unless we really tap into those skills that, that are implicit within the social sciences? So if we look at, you know, the work of, of people like Audre Lorde or, you know, uh, Paolo Freire or, or, or other, you know, critical social scientists, I would say in the broadest sense of the term, you know, that that's not just about looking at the ways in which we can um, escape from, you know, oppressive contexts uh, that are out there. It's actually about also investigating the way in which we locate and identify those seeds of oppression that, that are dormant and lie deep within us <laughs> that we also need to reveal as part of that process of transformative change. So these, these, are, these are complex matters that we're all addressing now in this climate emergency. Um, and I really, you know, I believe that the social sciences in conjunction uh, with other areas uh, are critical to, to achieving that change. Beautifully put, Wendy. Thank you. And I believe our um, audience can see you, so that's good. It's just <laughs> us in the special green room here. Can't, so, um, Blanche, not last but last, not least, um, your reflections on how you think the social sciences can contribute to action and knowledge on climate change. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And thanks. It's great to hear from the other panellists. Uh, and probably a lot of what I have to say is, you know, a bit repetitive, so I'll try to skip those bits. But, uh, you know, when I first went to university, I did a science degree and learned a lot about climate change there, but I pretty much dropped out of that degree because I found it, uh, you know, didn't offer me much in terms of what could be done about the problem. There was a lot of, you know, understanding why it was bad, but not knowing how to actually intervene in the systems that were causing it. And that's why eventually I came to do a social science degree uh, because I really wanted to, to know what are we going to do and, and how do we intervene in this problem that scientists are telling us is caused by humans. And, you know, for me, it seems obvious that if you want to address something that's caused by humans, you need the humanities and the social sciences to be looking at what it is that we're doing uh, and why we're doing it to be able to address that. So I guess that's why I've you know, turn to the social sciences and through my work there, I, I've mainly focused on education and uh, community engagement and communication a bit similar to Saffron. Uh, so looking at, you know, originally thinking that people didn't know about the problem uh, and we needed to work on community awareness and, and raising the profile of that. But through a lot of the work that I was doing with students and in communities, I guess after a while it became apparent to me that a lot of people know about the issue of climate change and survey after survey tells us that and tells us that the majority of people are really concerned about it and want you know the governments to be doing more and, and those sorts of things but a lot of people don't know what they can do that's actually meaningful when we're you know dealing with a systemic global problem and most people know that recycling at home isn't going to cut it and so you know, those, I think those are the kinds of questions that social science can help us address is, you know, what is it that people want to know and how do we support them to take action that can really address these problems uh, in through community and collective and systemic change. And so as part of that work, you know, alongside lots of others, I've also been focusing on the kinds of imaginaries we have around climate change uh, as a number of people have mentioned today the sort of technocentric or you know physical geography kind of bias coming out of well not bias but you know there's been some great work done through science but uh the sorts of ways that climate science tends to understand the, the climate system as being you know composed of lots of complex relationships but a kind of ambiguous understanding of where humans fit in that so science will tell us that humans are part of the climate system but the practices of science constantly position humans as outside through the ideals of trying to be objective about what they're doing so through social sciences and humanities uh, i've been trying to work on um, you know challenging those through uh, focusing on the intimate and everyday and intensely personal ways that climate change shows up in our you know, personal lives. So 
in my work that's been looking at experiences of climate distress and climate anxiety and alongside other social scientists how that plays out in people's really social world so looking at things like young people's reproductive um, decision making and, and how they're navigating those sorts of really big life choices in the context of um, extreme worry about climate change and so looking at how we can support people to continue engaging with the issue and the problem of climate change and avoid getting stuck long term in sort of you know denial as a coping mechanism and those sorts of things so yeah that's sort of where i'm coming from fantastic thank you and i really love the different scales um, at which um the work across the panel uh, is uh, positioned as well. It really illustrates some of the diversity in social science. So, I mean, if I was to sort of summarise up sort of one of the kind of messages I'm hearing, it's that if we don't include the social sciences in um, helping direct and um, inform our social responses to climate change, then those responses are going to be inadequate in terms of simply not active enough, ineffective in terms of not achieving the outcomes they tend to, and in many ways inequitable uh, and thoroughly imperfect, <laughs> creating a whole lot of other problems. Uh, so there's definitely a strong case for it, but I just want to take a moment to just think about how we can use our social science lens on this issue of how to address the problem of not enough social science in generating the sorts of responses we need. So those ones that are more active, that are more effective and that are more just and equitable. What is it What is it that we can learn? What's, I mean, this obviously <laughs> years of discussion here, but what's one or two things we can kind of take from our own social science, um, you know, arsenal Oh, it's a military term, our own social science sewing basket um, in order to stitch together a better response. Does anyone want to jump in? Sorry, I know we're going off script a little bit, but <laughs> I'm sure you can cope. What's, what are some of the insights from social science that help us understand why social science is not more um, front and centre? Adam, over to you. I just pick on something, pick up on something that Blanche said there. This kind of facade, if that's the right word, of of objectivity that very often natural physical sciences seeks to construct is something that social sciences, I think, is uh, particularly well uh, adept at uh, challenging or breaking down. And this is one of the things that's been kind of motivating uh, mine and our work in in Urubu, This question of of the importance of normativity in this, the importance of recognising if we want to position transformative change away from the techno scientific fixes, then we might say that it's, it was a contested term, but it's relating to the transformation of values, of beliefs, of practices of people, then we have to take uh, values and beliefs seriously. I think that that's something that we have a, a theoretical and a, and a, and a disciplinary uh, disposition to, to be able to do. So I think that's one of the starting points that we could perhaps jump off on. I mean, I'm very much influenced by the work of sociologists like Andrew Sayer, who, you know, very much about what matters to people is something that is real and important and is under recognised within within social sciences and particularly within climate. And it was the book, that, one of the books that uh, Noel mentioned at the beginning as well, the morals of, of climate is something I think that we should be looking more deeply at as well. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, no. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Uh, I, I guess I guess one thing that we've learned from many decades of research in the sociology of knowledge and the anthropology of knowledge um, is that the power of a quote good argument is never sufficient to win the argument. Um, and you know, if you look at some of the the sort of historical uh, sociology conducted by people like Philip Morofsky, the political economist uh, in the United States, or the, the wonderful work of the uh, intellectual historian Quinn Slobodian in his book Globalists, which and both Morofsky and Slobodian focus on 
what we nowadays call neoliberal thinkers who in the 1940s and 50s were in a relative minority um, in Western countries, uh, worked incredibly hard over many decades to shift thinking. Uh, they weren't particularly successful until circumstances, you know, a series of crises in Chile and other countries uh, opened a door. Um, so I think, I guess one of the things that one learns, and particularly noting the power of think tanks in many modern Western democracies to in propagating particular ideas, um, is this sort of politely academic idea of the good argument where, you know, logic and good evidence will win the day is, um, and I'm sure most of us would agree with this anyway, is hopelessly naive. So, um, you know, if one is wanting to shift the conversation, yes, of course you need good evidence, you need great arguments, uh, you need good rhetoric, you need to be able to move people the level of their sort of passions and the, the sort of gut feeling about things. Um, but there has to be some sort of strategic uh, action to get those arguments out there wherever you want to shape the conversation. Well, that's the challenge we face then, isn't it? We need to find strategic arguments to get the, the social science out there. I think that's um, absolutely true. I think the, the point about naivety um, is a really, you know, it sort of points to one of those contributions social sciences makes too as well, is just a really, um, sometimes it does, you know, make you feel like the kind of greatest cynic in the room, but um, the one that's always alert to the sorts of politics that are bubbling under the surface. It brings us to, um, I guess, the next kind of like big topic area, and we can keep sort of circling through these, but, um, you know, which is the way that climate change challenges social science. So the challenge we've discussed now is the need for it to sort of stand up and be counted, if you like, stand up and be heard. And, you know, we need to think about how we can use our understanding of those knowledge politics and all of the um, you know, barriers that that poses. Um, but in what other ways does climate change challenge social science? And this could range from deep questions around what we think is true and real through to questions of how we organise ourselves and what we're doing and maybe we need more labs or something. <laughs> um, Wendy, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll follow on from that. Thanks, Lauren. I mean, I think a, a big part of it is is critical reframing of the ways in which, you know, the status quo is presented to us as, as being the only reality. I'll give an example of that, which is where I think climate change or the climate emergency is really challenging social sciences or the framing of social science um, in the in the in the speed uh, with which action is required. And so uh, as everyone gets caught up in the narrative of speed, which is absolutely true, and, and, and in no way am I suggesting that we don't need to act swiftly with speed in a way that humanity has never done before. But unfortunately, I think that gets funneled into the need then for a quick techno fix. And so the debate quickly becomes centred around, you know, even from, uh, you know, people that I would say would usually have a much more expansive view, it quickly comes down to the need to reduce energy emissions through certain types of technologies that will allow us to get to where we want to be, for example, in, in 2030. And I think we saw that with COVID as well. So it quickly became around the need for a scientific medical um, fix around vaccines. Um, and yes, they're important. So uh, it's not an either or. It's not that those things aren't important and that we don't have the capabilities and skills as a species to to develop those. But but what's missing, of course, is all of the work that goes into making those um, creating those, organising systems to distribute those, to assess the ethics around those. Um, all of that work is is also going on simultaneously. Um, so it's it's it, this is why it's a hand in hand thing. We talk a lot about, you know, the need to uh, move on from binaries, for example, in around human nature binaries or, um, you know, city and region, et cetera, and the way in which those are collapsing. And yet in our disciplines, we still position the social sciences against the sciences, when in fact, they're incredibly entangled, deeply implicated in each other. And they, and they in a sense, only work together. Um, and yet it's the social sciences that are rendered invisible. And so I think what we're doing in this panel and what you're doing, Lauren, and thanks for organising this, is to raise that visibility, bring what is already there, 
to the surface so that we can recognise and celebrate it better. Mm, mm. Exceptionally well put. Yes, Saffron. Now, I'm sure you heard that word speed and thought, hang on, I've got something to say about that. <laughs> um, well, I actually was going to bring up two different topics. I completely agree with what Wendy is saying, and as, as you can see, doing lots of nodding to all the panel throughout this session. <laughs> um, but two, two different things in how climate change uh, challenges our work as social scientists. The first is perhaps quite obviously in terms of our research practices, you know, and our teaching practices. And I don't know about you guys um, based over in Australia, Melbourne and Sydney, um, but certainly here in Exeter in the UK, we're thinking a lot about, for example, the field, field trips that we run with undergraduates. And is it still morally, ethically OK to take a bunch of undergrads to Brazil from London um, to learn about, you know, um, Amazon deforestation, be immersed in the field site? You know, that's such valuable learning experience, but a massive carbon emissions, um, you know, tally associated with that field trip when it runs every year with 30, 40, 50 students. Um, you know, so we are having a big rethink about the field trips that we have and um, making them where, um, wherever we can into land-based travel options, for example, and increasingly also having um, field trips that are based um, like in the lab. So you can do them virtually, which also has other EDI implications, equality, diversity, inclusion, you know, so these are, are good things for many reasons. Um, and of course, in our own research practices as well, um, thinking through things like um, how to avoid doing helicopter science, right? Um, pitching ourselves into communities with which we have very little or tenuous links um, and instead um uh, training or collaborating with um, Indigenous researchers and actually building much stronger, more successful, more interesting, more rich data, data sets through that process. Um, so, you know, there's lots of benefits, I think. I think the pandemic has challenged us significantly and in my personal opinion, uh, hopefully we'll see many of these practices continue into our academic lives and we'll have um, hopefully big impacts on how we um, behave as more sustainably as researchers um, ourselves. And the second thing I wanted to note is that I'm sure everybody on the panel and you said even in your intro and I'm always really struck by this I was a postdoc in Melbourne for three years is the you know um um talking about indigenous um, ownership of land for example as the starting point for the conversation and of course when we're do talking about climate change research um scholars have argued really you know um powerfully about how there can't be any um, climate um, successful climate solutions or however we might want to kind of think about that action or whatever and without thinking of um, the legacy of colonialism for example and so thinking about whose voices are represented who's at the table I mean I know many of you are involved in IPCC or critique IPCC processes and so on um, and think um, we had a me and um, a, a colleague um, uh, had a special issue in climatic change out in November and we tried really hard to get diversity of opinions in that special issue it's all about communication of, of climate change for IPCC um, and uh, Ritoti Chakraborty and uh, Pasang Yangtze Sherpa for example wrote about Himalayan knowledges and how they were incorporated or not into the IPCC process and what challenges that threw up and I think those sorts of insights are so important and and still you know we know that our social science uh, physical sciences and others are dominated by white, um, you know, middle class, upper class, um, male perspectives. So there's a, um, and and certain ethnicities, you know, dominate. Um, so we really need to think about how how our how our social science is constructed and what that means for how how we're thinking about the research questions that we pose in the first place. Very well put. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to say some of us are in the IPCC and critique it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So look, you're raising some really, really um, important points. And I think, you know, being reflective about our practices. And again, if we could sort of specify the social sciences, you know, I think it's probably justifiable to say is that, you know, we do like to get out there in the world, sort of part and parcel of our perspective, isn't it? Um, and so travel and mobility is, very much part of that, though of course we all know we can do very good field work right at home. Um, <laughs> feminist geography has taught us that. Um, but yeah, I think these these questions about thinking about the norms, even some of those, um, you know, really, really implicit habits and approaches that shape our knowledge production and how we can and question those right down through to thinking about, yeah, absolutely things like colonialism um, and of course, uh you know capitalism in the kind of more recent times as well um blanche i know you've 
been thinking about some of these questions as well about the challenges that climate change is posing to research, to education, um, perhaps to social sciences specifically. Do you want to just share a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, I have I have lots of scattered thoughts, so I'll see if I can connect any of them. But yeah, everything um, that the panel's been saying, I think is really valuable. Um, just because you've raised two questions, Lauren, there about, uh, you know, how do we get the social science word out there, but also what do we need to do better ourselves? Um, I guess one thing I was thinking was, uh, you know, potentially the, the modes uh, and the means of sort of impact that that social science can have operates differently to what we've seen science have. And I think, you know, the kinds of knowledge that they produce, you know, in the form of, say, a graph or a number or a statistic that can kind of be broadcast and uh, to lots of different audiences uh, where there's an assumption that that kind of statistic um, applies universally or is always you know true whereas I think you know a lot of social science knowledge is really always about the local context and being situated so I think that the the mechanism for social science having impact is always going to be different and that if we try to compare ourselves up to the the hard sciences we'll we might just be looking for metrics around impact that just aren't going to work for us. So I know that in the the sort of social research is doing a lot of empirical qualitative research that researchers have really, um, you know, deep and long running relationships with the communities that they work through work with and that there's a lot of two way interchange between knowledge there that everyone's learning off each other. And so I think we're probably having a lot more impact uh, through that level at the grassroots um, than we might otherwise uh, appreciate. And I know that I get a lot of emails from people who are, you know, just in the last month or so, someone who's trying to design a new video game, uh, someone who's developing a pastoral care program for Christian churches in Australia and um, the states around supporting people in community with climate anxiety, um, someone else who's trying to start a nonprofit around climate communication, um, getting in touch with me to ask for advice around how, you know, how they can best organize their program and, and those sorts of things. So I know that there's a lot of hunger out there from community activists for support and insight from the social sciences. And I think that working through at that level has a lot of potential as well, even though it might not show up as kind of, you know, the the, the study that then gets a thousand, um, you know, opinion pieces in the news written about it or those sorts of things. Um, at the same time, I think we do need to think differently around what counts as an output or impact. And I think this is probably not, not so much around researchers, but around the structures we have to fit in. So I'm a big fan of Aaron Thierry and uh, his colleagues work as part of the Scientist Rebellion in the UK. And they've got a paper called, I think from publications to public actions and talking about why it's important for scientists and social scientists to be participating in um, you know, nonviolent direct action. And I think they make a really great case through a lot of reasons for why uh, there's an important role for academics of all kinds, but including social scientists to be, um, you know, not just writing papers for ourselves to read, um, but, you know, really engaging in a diverse range of, of ways of communicating with society. Mm. So I think, you know, doing those sort of more visible mm. types and finding a way for the academy to recognise that that counts as, you know, impact. Um, but also looking at the the more sort of intangible grassroots relationship building, I think are really valuable. Mm. Absolutely, thanks Blanche. And, um, you know, in terms of those alternative metrics and stuff, a lot of us uh, have turned to social media and can I just direct people, um, so you might have picked up, we're having a few technical issues here, a whole, um, plethora of them, including we don't seem to have our Q&A function. So 
Uh, if you do have a question just for the last 10 minutes, we ask that you actually email it through to Kerr, that's C-U-R, <laughs> at rmit.edu.au or tweet it to at rmit underscore Kerr, C-U-R. Let's see if anyone <laughs> manages that. It's a little bit convoluted. Apologies for that. But um, look, we've got plenty to keep discussing. I mean, part of what strikes me is the way that, you know, on the one hand, climate change exposes a lot of strengths of social science, and that's where we just started the discussion. But on the other hand, it also exposes some of its weaknesses. Some of those weaknesses are shared by other areas of the academy. So that's about the outputs, that's about the kind of mobility imperative to be, but um, yeah, in, including, you know, the, the makeup of um, social science, which I think is, you know, probably fairly similar to other parts of the academy as well. Are there any particular weaknesses of social sciences that climate change requires we address? I'm wondering here, particularly about that word social. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> I think one of the issues which is to some degree uh, social science can help to address but to, to another degree is a little bit outside of its own control is the way is the legitimacy and authority that social scientific knowledge has in society and this is a this is a big problem so people obviously like Saffron who's looking at the media communication would you know take some interest in 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 doing but I mean one of the things that struck me in my own research was when I'm interviewing people who are participating, interviewing scientists who are participating in something like the IPCC and I ask their motivation and they'll say something was wrong with the world. I saw the climate change and I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to change the world. And if this is the natural or physical scientist, then society as a whole would nod and say this is fine. If it's a social scientist, there might be a, little, <coughs> a different degree of legitimacy, <coughs> excuse me, or different uh, uh, a, a more um, cynical view placed on that, and I think that it's wrong in both cases that we, that you know, society needs to address the way that both physical physical science is approached as objective and neutral and so on, and social science it's not. So that's something that I think that social science can also help to address. It might seem a bit like navel gazy or so, but it's I think it's important that those kind of outputs and in, impacts. Uh, are, are addressed in there and this kind of relates to this position or relevance of social science that that, that we see and when you uh, in your introduction Lauren you mentioned that you know social sciences are definitely in the minority in organizations like the IPCC I think one of the risks that social science runs one of the challenges it has to face is not to play this secondary role not to be siloed off in just answering particular questions or okay we'll look at the climate denialists or something <clears throat> i think it's really important that so social science presents itself as being able to as Noel said speak a voice speak for the climate to to present uh the climate in a, in, a, in a particular way and to help frame the climate issue in a way mm -hmm. we don't just leave that framing of the climate issue to natural scientists that we have a, a, a way mm -hmm. of doing that that embraces multiple voices embraces multiple knowledge systems indigenous voices and so on absolutely i guess i mean and this, i guess sort of working towards you know our last sort of um discussion point but it does strike me that you know there's possibly a pretty big blind spot <laughs> in social sciences at least in terms of kind of you know, what it has considered within its realm and, and discussed. And, you know, there's been what we social scientists would call a materiality turn, but, you know, <laughs> discover of kind of physical realities in some ways. But and there's obviously aspects of that. But, uh, um, and Noel, you talked about the way in which, you know, there has been a turn towards, towards sort of climate change science in that uh, climate change sort of social science but it does strike me that there still is a need for a kind of more general uh, alertness to the physical realities um, of the world in the social science that we do. Um, we don't often have for example in our social science papers a kind of necessarily a geographical context piece that really describes it in in physical terms for example but 
Saffron, I just wanted to ask you, and then Noel, I know you've looked at this as well, but you're in this fantastic program called Advancing Capacity for Climate and Environment Social Science, which I imagine has been stimulated a little bit by the need, uh, by the expectation that there's a need to advance capacity in climate and environment social science. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Because it seems like the sort of thing that, the sort of direction perhaps we need to go in. Yeah, well, I mean, I can't talk um, much about where this funding stream come, came from, apart from, you know, and much like ed, any of you working in academic research, that suddenly these calls are announced and they have very short deadlines and someone somewhere in government has gone, this would be a good idea and we've got a big pot of money, we just need to spend it quick. Um, I, I, you know, I hesitate to say that that's what's happened in this situation. However, uh, it was a very short deadline. We applied and a very uh, thankfully, we luckily got the, uh, got the grant, got the network grant. Um, um, but it, yes, obviously there has been discussion somewhere in UK government that social science is important, that knowledge at the moment, knowledge, skills, expertise is not being effectively utilised and that these are absolutely key to make um, uh, uh, successful uh, mitigation and adaptation policy and strategies going forward. So that's um, you know where the uh, access network came in. So yeah, advancing capacity in environment and social, um, environmental, social science and climate change. Um, so yeah, the point I, I laid it out before, I, if I could just, I'll run through, there are four different work packages. So um, the first one is about mapping, assessing and learning. So that's about catalyzing change in policy cultures um, um, and in institutions and business and civil society. Then there's another one, which is about empowerment, um, training and mentoring, both in policy context and in um, academia as well. For example, um, we're uh, running a transformation, a Transformative Leaders College, which will bring together cohorts of both policy and um, early career academics um, together to learn together about, you know, what are the challenges and the opportunities for working together, bringing social science expertise into the policy process. And we hope that that network will have a real legacy effect going forward. Um, uh, the third work package is about innovation. So we've got this thing called a flex fund. So although it sounds like a massive chunk of money, a lot of it will be going into kind of smaller projects that would be piloting off, you know, trialing innovative social science approaches um, to uh, to these kind of real challenges, policy challenges. And the last one is about championing and coordinating across social science. So really being a, a voice, uh, us, you know, directly employed by the grant, but also more widely trying to advocate for social science. You know, why are the social sciences important what uh, what perspectives can they bring that others uh, can't and um, what what is lost when you don't have social science perspectives in the debate um, and we're going to be having a few things in there which are kind of particular tools for example like a data hub bringing together actually no data everywhere but there's no kind of central point for so we're going to try and bring together um, many of the environmental um, uh, data sets you know just as a list of links even on a web page mm. so people can bring those together across many of the different agencies again same in Australia I know that you know you're working across state, local, regional governments and so on um, and, and a lot of that expertise can kind of get lost in the ether and the other thing we're going to have is a public engagement tracker so we're actually going to be uh, developing it or we are developing a tool right now that will enable us to look at both social media and with our colleagues in what's called the CAR Centre based at the University of Bath um, looking at how public attitudes are uh, um, evolving and responding to come some of these key issues because we know policymakers are really interested in this and that can often provide a real mandate for change um, and we need to speak more strongly about that Blanche talked about it right at the beginning right that there is a real strong consensus about the need for climate action and other action on other environment biodiversity issues um, yeah. so bringing those to the fore that's fantastic well that's certainly one example of the sort of direction I would love to see social science going in uh, but to finish up maybe I could just have an idea from each of the other panelists about where they would like to see social science social science 2030 what it's what it should it look like Noel? <laughs> oh easy question um well just <laughs> just riff off what Adam said a minute ago I think I think we've got a lot of great things to say but they're often a bit under the radar outside the universities and I think one of them is around um the kind of value questions that climate change raises. Uh, there seems to be a public perception that expertise is about facts. Uh, it's about things that you can describe and explain and measure and predict. Um, and as Andrew Sayre, who Adam mentioned, has argued many times, that's very unfair to questions around values, goals, morals, ethics, because we need high quality arguments about those things which mm -hmm. are profoundly insinuated in the climate change question. So I guess by 2030, 
I'd like to see social scientists more visible talking about those questions credibly. This is mm -hmm. Adam's point, credibly, rather than those things being seen as somehow matters of opinion or merely political. Thank you. Yeah. Wendy, over to you. What would you like Social mm -hmm. Science 2030 to look like? Look, I'd like to see the, the practices um, somehow reflected in the meta theme. So, um, you know, I think in practice, there's a lot of really interesting directions that social scientists are taking where, you know, they're bringing in um, fantastic insights from Indigenous knowledges, for example, um, looking at, you know, different pluralist ways of thinking about the world, particularly rethinking what we mean by urban nature, for example, as we've seen, you know, from Matt Gandy to, to others, um, you know, eco cosmologies, urban constellations, there's a whole plethora of really interesting and intricate work that's going on, uh, very thoughtful work. And I think, unfortunately, when you come back to the tag social sciences, it does lend itself to a very anthropocentric <laughs> um, agenda. And so whilst I think the practice of social scientists is, is, is really vital, um, I, I wonder if, if that label is, is going to be an anchor on us um, as we move into clearly uh, much more hybrid, much more um, binary sensitive futures. So, mm. Well, the Academy of Social Sciences might have to be a bit fleet footed in that sense. Adam, over to you. I think Noel summed up uh, many of my uh, ideas quite well there. I think that, yeah, this this uh, reinvigorated um, approach to understanding and appreciating values and morals and, and beliefs and so on. Uh, maybe uh, working group four in the IPCC for social sciences. Uh, <laughs> that might be a little bit too uh, siloed, but I think, so, you know, definitely greater institutional participation and uh, in the in the big uh, if, if they still exist at that point uh, in the big institutions of, of knowledge production I think would be mm, important. Thank you Adam and last word for you Blanche. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say on behalf of all early career researchers I hope there's uh, more secure jobs for <laughs> multidisciplinary, you know, environmental social scientists. And it's really critical if we do want more diversity in our social scientists as well. So, yeah. Great point. That's a very future oriented point um, and you know, speaks to the transformation that Wendy mentioned at the start as well, that we need to be part of and think internally as well as externally. Uh, and that's absolutely what climate change requires us to do at many, many levels as well. So look, thank you everyone for joining us. I really do apologise for the technological issues, which meant a bit of a late start and uh, less engagement with you than we would have hoped. But we hope that out there somewhere in the ether, uh, you've enjoyed um, this conversation. I know I certainly have, and I'd like to thank our wonderful panellists as well as our um, colleagues at the Academy of Social Sciences, as well as Jenny, Lucy and Alana Altus at RMIT for making it happen. So thank you everyone. And uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation in other forms. Thank you. Good night.